The most important event in the universe was the atonement of the Savior, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Without the Savior's birth, there would not have been an atonement. One might say that the details of the birth of the Savior don't really matter. What is most important is that he was born. But perhaps understanding circumstances around his birth will bear record that he truly is the Holy Messiah. For examples, perhaps we are to learn that every child should have a stable family. Actually, many myths have arisen around the simple story of the Savior's birth as told in the scriptures. As an example of Christmas myths, the scriptures never say anything about an innkeeper and never say the Savior was born in a dirty stable surrounded by animals. The scriptures only say he was wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger. In about 1223 AD, St. Francis of Assisi wanted to do a midnight mass in the little town of Grezio, Italy, but the church was too small. He had the idea of portraying the first Christmas outside. He brought hay, an ox, and an ass, and a manger like those of his time. He is credited with inventing the first nativity scene. As another example, the scriptures never tell us who the wise men were, where they came from, or even how many there were. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said they were true prophets to whom deity revealed that the promised Messiah had been born among men. Were these lone prophets from some desert place? Or had they ministered to a body of God's people who had been broken off from the main group in Israel? Could they have been from one of the groups mentioned in the allegory of the olive tree in Jacob 5? Did they possess some scripture that included a prophecy of the new star at the Savior's birth? We don't know. Scholars have said that since Herod killed all the children two years and younger, the wise men may not have, may not have arrived until a year or two after the Savior's birth. A camel caravan fully loaded can travel 18 to 20 miles per day. If the wise men averaged 10 miles per day on their journey, not counting Sabbath days, they could have come 3,000 miles in a year or 6,000 miles in two years and could have come from as far as the east coast of China or beyond. Many church scholars now believe that somewhere along this lonely green spot on the coast of Oman is the site of Nephi's bountiful. This area completely matches Nephi's description of the place they called bountiful. When the Book of Mormon came out, critics claimed there could not be such a place on the Arabian Peninsula. Indeed, this seems like the only one. The best frankincense and myrrh in the Middle East came from this area. Could the wise men have visited this area on their way to visit the Christ child? This is a representation of Helena, the mother of Constantine, found on an ancient coin. After Constantine became a Christian, Helena traveled to the Holy Land in about 326 AD to find the sacred sites. Helena chose a spot inside the walls of the old city of Jerusalem as the place of the crucifixion. That is where the Church of the Holy Sepulchre was built. But Hebrews 13 verse 12 clearly states that the Savior suffered outside the gate. John 19 verse 20 says that he was crucified nigh to the city, not in the city. President Harold B. Lee said that the garden tomb, which is outside the city walls, was where the Savior was crucified. Helena did the best she knew how, but she got the place of the crucifixion and the burial wrong. Based on a rumor 300 years after the Savior's birth that he had been born in a cave within Bethlehem, Helena chose a cave in what is now modern-day Bethlehem as the site of the holy birth. It is there that the Basilica of the Nativity was built. There are three sources of the idea that the birth took place in a cave, one saying it was in Bethlehem and two saying it was outside Bethlehem. Number one, origin of Alexandria, who lived 200 years after the Savior, said there was a rumor 
a rumor that the birth took place in a certain cave in Bethlehem. Number two, there is an apocryphal book called the Protoevangelium of James that claims the birth was in a cave outside of Bethlehem. But the rest of the book makes it clear that the writer didn't understand Jewish history or tradition and that the book is not very reliable. Number three, Justin Martyr said, but when the child was born in Bethlehem, since Joseph could not find a lodging in that village, he took up his quarters in a certain cave near the village. And while they were there, Mary brought forth Christ and placed him in a manger. And here the Magi came from Arabia and found him. This account is unreliable because the scripture text clearly says that the wise men visited the child when he was in a house. Many scholars believe that the visit of the wise men as Herod had all children to and under put to death. The idea that Joseph and Mary and the baby lived in a cave for a year or more when Joseph was a carpenter is untenable. Besides, Luke 2, verse 39, clearly states that after the ritual purification, they returned to Nazareth. So the cave story either relies on a 300-year-old rumor or two other completely unreliable accounts. Note that one of the prophets visited the Basilica of the Nativity and said he felt it was a holy place, but didn't say the Savior was born there. Pilgrims have visited the place for over a thousand years, believing it was where the Savior was born. Surely their sincerity has sanctified the place, but that doesn't necessarily mean that is where the holy birth occurred. Helena did the best she knew how, but her choice of where the Savior was born is probably wrong too. Instead of trusting the mother of Constantine, how about if we trust the scriptures instead? This is the first place in the Bible that Bethlehem is mentioned. It is also the first mention of the Tower of Ader or Tower of the Flock. There are debates about the actual location of Rachel's burial, but by tradition, it is somewhere along the road from modern day Bethlehem to Jerusalem. Zion means the pure in heart because that is what the Lord says it means. But in Hebrew, it can also be a masculine noun meaning signpost, monument, or grave marker. In other words, a pillar. If Rachel was buried in a cave in a mountain, like Abraham's wife Sarah was, and Jacob set a pillar or monument by her grave, that mountain could have become known as Mount Zion. And Joseph went up unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. For unto you is born this day in the city of David. Let us now go even unto Bethlehem. From these scriptures, it is clear that Bethlehem and the city of David were considered to be the same place. These two references are the first mention of the city of David in the Old Testament. It is clear that the city of David was a fortress or castle, namely the castle of Zion. Is there any evidence of an ancient castle or fortress at modern day Bethlehem? No, none at all. So what else do the scriptures tell us about the birthplace of Jesus? When the wise men came to Jerusalem asking where he had been born, who was king of the Jews, Herod gathered his chief priests and scribes together to ask them where the Messiah was expected to be born. They apparently referred him to this prophecy by Micah, in which Micah says he would be born in Bethlehem, Ephrathah. This prophecy is about a woman referred to as the daughter of Zion in labor to bring forth a king, namely the Messiah. Stronghold could also be translated fortress, indicating that the tower of the flock was part of the fortress or castle of Zion. Second Samuel chapter five verse seven said, David took the stronghold of Zion. 
Note that Micah chapter 4 verse 9 says that the woman will flee to Babylon and be delivered there. W. Robertson Smith, a biblical scholar, believes that the reference to Babylon is an interpolation. If the interpolation occurred before the Savior's birth, it may have led the spies of Herod to look for the Christ child in Babylon instead of Egypt. We don't know exactly where the Tower of the Flock was, but it was evidently between modern-day Bethlehem and Jerusalem. In Hebrew, the Tower of the Flock is Migdal Eder. Migdal Eder was just barely within the rabbinic distance limit from Jerusalem in order for a lamb born there to be a valid sacrificial lamb, while a lamb born at modern Bethlehem was just barely outside that distance. The Tower of the Flock was, in ancient times, a military tower. It was probably on a hill where advancing threats could be seen from multiple directions. In the days of Jesus, the Tower of the Flock was used to overlook the hills and spot where the herds of sheep were grazing. Bethlehem Ephrata was first mentioned in just Genesis in connection with the death of Jacob's wife, Rachel. It is also the name of, it is also the home of Naomi's husband in the book of Ruth, and is also the home of Jesse, the father of King David. So Bethlehem, Ephrata, was a very ancient place. Some archaeologists doubt that modern day Bethlehem was even inhabited in the days of Jesus. Other scholars have suggested that Bethlehem, Ephrata, could have been a village located at the hill now known as Ramat Rachel. Alfred Edersheim was often quoted by Elder James E. Talmadge in Jesus the Christ. He said that the Messiah was to be born in Bethlehem was a settled conviction. Equally so was the belief that he was to be revealed from Megdal Eder, the Tower of the Flock, this Migdal Eder was not the watchtower for the ordinary flocks which pastured on the barren sheep ground beyond Bethlehem, but lay close to the town on the road to Jerusalem. A passage in the Mishnah leads to the conclusion that the flocks which pastured there were destined for temple sacrifices, and accordingly that the shepherds who watched over them were not ordinary shepherds. Thus, Jewish tradition in some dim manner apprehended the first revelation of the Messiah from that Migdal Eder. Of the deep symbolic significance of such a coincidence, it is needless to speak. Some believe that the Tower of the Flock was where the shepherds took ewes that were about to give birth to a special stall or birthing room that gave some protection from the weather and from wild animals. These specially trained shepherds were tasked with keeping the little lambs from being hurt or blemished if they thrashed about after they were born. The shepherds wrapped the little lambs in stalls so they would not be blemished. Is it possible that the Savior was born in the very place where lambs were born that were destined for sacrifice at the temple in Jerusalem? In this footnote, in Alfred Edersheim's book, The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah, we see an odd reference that says Christ was born at the royal castle of Bethlehem. Once again, we have a reference that there was a castle at Bethlehem, the city of David. To summarize Micah's mess messianic prophecy, the birth of the Messiah was to be revealed at the Tower of the Flock. A woman called the daughter of Zion would be in labor at the Tower of the Flock and would bring forth a king. The Tower of the Flock was part of a fortress or castle called the City of David, which the shepherds identified as Bethlehem. There is no archaeological evidence that there was ever a castle or fortress at modern-day Bethlehem. In fact, an archaeologist claims there is no evidence that modern-day Bethlehem was even inhabited, inhabited at the time of Jesus. Has a castle or fortress ever been discovered anywhere nearby? Yes.
This is a map from Bing Maps of the area from modern day Bethlehem, north to Jerusalem. The road from Hebron runs just north of modern day Bethlehem. It goes next to a hill called Ramat Rachel. In Hebrew, Rama means hill and Rachel means lamb. In the so-called Hebrew construct form, Rama changes to Ramat. So Ramat Rachel means the hill of Rachel. In Hebrew, since Rachel means lamb, Ramat Rachel also means the hill of the lamb. This has long been a strategic hill because whoever controlled the hill could control who could pass by on the road below. Excavations near the top of the hill have recently uncovered a castle, or castle that was used by the kings of Judah. It is labeled Archaeological Garden and the Google satellite map on the right. A recent book by Oded Lipschitz and Manfred Oemi is called What Are the so Stones Whispering? Ramat Rachel, 3,000 Years of Forgotten History. So the settlement at Ramat Rachel goes back to about the time of King David, who, according to Wikipedia, lived around 1000 BC. There is no archaeological evidence that there was ever a castle or fort in the town known as Bethlehem today. According to one Jewish scholar, there is evidence the Bethlehem in the West Bank, or what Israelis call Judea, was not even inhabited in the first century. The Maccabees destroyed the castle at Ramat Rachel in the second century BC. It had been used by kings of Judah before the Babylonian captivity, but after that time had been used for centuries by foreign rulers. However, at the time of Christ, there was a small inhabited village near the ruins of the castle. This little village was destroyed by the Romans in about 70 AD. Ramat Rachel is next to the main road from Hebron to Jerusalem. Any army coming from the south toward Jerusalem would have to pass by the hill on that road. So the hill itself was a very strategic place, and a tower on that hill would have helped warn of armies coming from multiple directions. Is it possible that in the days of Jesus, Bethlehem, Ephrata, was actually the little village at the top of the hill next to the ruins of the castle? Is it possible that the Savior was born right under the noses of the Romans, only a few hundred feet from a castle where kings of Judah may have been born? Could some of Joseph's relatives have still been living in that little village next to the ruins of the castle? But is it even reasonable to consider the possibility that modern-day Bethlehem is not in the same place as Bethlehem Ephrathah in the days of Jesus? The oldest known surviving map of the Holy Land is a mosaic on the floor of a Byzantine church called the Church of St. George in Madaba, Jordan. On the left is a depiction of Jerusalem. The church was dedicated in 542 A.D., and some buildings in Jerusalem in 570 AD do not appear in the mosaic, so the mosaic was likely created before 570 AD. The top of the map is facing eastward. Labels are in Greek. The blue arrow points to the Greek name for Bethlehem. The red arrow points to the Greek for Ephratha. This indicates that in the 6th century AD, Bethlehem was not the same place as Ephratha. Ephratha was closer to Jerusalem than Bethlehem, and Ephratha appears to be on a hill. The place marked Bethlehem in this map would have been the Bethlehem visited by Constantine's mother, which is the same as modern-day Bethlehem. It is not unlikely at all that the place marked Ephratha in this map is the place Micah called Bethlehem Ephratha. This is an ancient seal found at Ramat Rachel. The letters are in the Phoenician alphabet. The Hebrew alphabet was derived from the Phoenician alphabet. The letters on this seal say Lamelech Hebron, which is Hebrew for to the king of Hebron. David was anointed king in Hebron, 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 3. 
Before he ever invaded Jerusalem, he would have been known as the king of Hebron. Seals like this have been found in multiple places in Israel, but the greatest number of seals like this have been found at Ramat Rachel. Ramat Rachel was recently annexed to the city of Jerusalem proper. It is part of a privately owned kibbutz. On this kibbutz, Mitzpeh Yair is a unique monument erected in memory of Yair Engel, born on the kibbutz as the grandson of two of its earliest members. Its base is the fortress walls of centuries ago. The panoramic view from this stone observation point takes in the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem, Mount Scopus, Bethlehem, and the Church of the Nativity, and a large portion of the modern city of Jerusalem. Nephite prophets knew quite a bit about the coming of the Messiah. They knew he would come 600 years from the time Levi left Jerusalem. Samuel the Lamanite prophesied within the accuracy of one year when the Savior would be born. Alma knew the Savior would be born of Mary in the land of Jerusalem, meaning the area of Jerusalem. Just as you might tell someone from New Jersey that you are from Salt Lake City, even though you actually live a few miles away in Bountiful. He didn't know the Savior would be born in Bethlehem, but he knew it would be in the area of Jerusalem. Nephi knew that the Savior's mother would be from Nazareth. James E. Talmage in Jesus Christ tells us that Joseph was a direct descendant of King David, and had it not been for the Romans, first Joseph and then Jesus would have been king. For this taxing, which was actually a kingdom-wide census ordered by Augustus in 2 BC, Joseph returned to his ancestral home, where King David as a boy had been a shepherd. We are told in Luke 2, verse 41, that Joseph and Mary went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of the Passover. That would have been a natural time for them to comply with the order of Augustus for the census. Have you ever wondered why Joseph and Mary didn't just stay with Elizabeth and Zacharias? Mary had visited them only six months earlier. It was the first year that Joseph and Mary were together. Just like other new couples, they had to decide whose relatives to spend the holiday with. In this case, since Joseph had to comply with the census, it seems likely that they planned to spend Passover with Joseph's relatives at Bethlehem. Delivering a baby along the way would have been very dangerous. Surely Joseph arranged for them to arrive, arrive at least a few days in advance, as is implied by while they were there the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. In ancient Israel, inns called khans or caravans were not like modern motels. They were places along the road where travelers could rest and recover from a day's journey, places where travelers could stay usually without paying. Rooms opened into a central courtyard, but there was very little privacy. There was often a person who attended each inn who charged travelers for extra services like taking care of their animals. Caravans arrived were typically on major roads in places where it took more than a day's journey to travel between reasonable destinations, spaced so that after a day's journey, one could either reach another caravan or a city. Cons were smaller and were found in larger cities. In smaller towns, the people would show customary Middle Eastern hospitality. No archaeological evidence has been found of a khan or a caravanserai at the time of the Savior in what is now modern-day Bethlehem. The earliest manuscripts we have of the New Testament aren't Greek. The word in occurs only twice in the King James Version of the Bible. 
The original Greek of one of them is the word pandokeon, which designates a con or caravanserai in the story of the Good Samaritan, Luke chapter 10, verse 36. But the word translated in in Luke 2 is not pandokeon, but rather kataluma. Kataluma does not have the meaning of caravanserai. Kataluma occurs only three times in the Greek New Testament. The other two times, it is used in describing the place where the Savior and his disciples ate the Last Supper. In Luke 22, verse 11 is the phrase, where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? The translation of Kataluma there is guest chamber. Since the Savior was born at the time of the Passover, when it was very crowded and apparently Mary was in labor during the evening and the Savior was born during the night. And because a mother being delivered of a child was considered unclean because of the blood, a crowded guest chamber would have been no place for a woman in labor to have a baby. Two of the major sources of information about Jerusalem in the days of Jesus are the New Testament itself and the writings of Josephus. They don't always agree in details of timing. For example, Josephus says that after the death of Herod, Augustus appointed Herod Archelaus, who reigned for 10 years and then was banished to Vienna. Josephus says that Quirinius, was appointed governor of Syria at the same time as the banishment of Archelaus. Quirinius is the same person called Cyrenius in Luke 2. The birth of the Savior in Luke 2 is at the time of the taxing made when Cyrenius was governor. The arrival of the wise men and their visit with Herod is after the Savior's birth, so Herod was quite clearly still alive after Cyrenius became governor of Syria. Josephus' account of when Cyrenius became governor of Syria is clearly flawed. Calculations based on the writings of Josephus can lead to the conclusion that Herod the Great died about 4 BC, but again, that timing is problematic. Luke 3 says that John the Baptist received the word of God and began preaching in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. Tiberius began his reign as emperor in September 14 AD. So his 15th year would have been from September 28 AD to September 29 AD. When Gabriel visited Mary, he said Elizabeth was in the sixth month of her pregnancy. So she was at least five months pregnant. Mary visited Elizabeth soon thereafter, stayed with her for about three months, and left before John was born. So the pregnant Mary must have arrived before Elizabeth was about six months pregnant. And therefore, John must have been about five to six months older than Jesus. Jesus started his public ministry at age 30 because one had to be 30 to become a rabbi, and he followed all of the rules. John clearly started preaching before the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. So the earliest Jesus could have started preaching was also September A.D. 28. Thirty years before that was September 3 B.C. But since Jesus was born about Passover, the earliest he could have been born would have been March of 2 B.C. Josephus wrote the Antiquities of the Jews about 94 A.D. and did the best he could with the sources he had. Luke lived much nearer the time of the events in his gospel and had no reason to fabricate the timing of Cyrenius' governorship or the timing of the beginning of the ministry of John the Baptist, since the earliest that the Savior could have been born was March of 2 BC, and since the book of Matthew says that Herod the Great was still alive when Jesus was born and when the wise men arrived as much as two years later, it appears that the idea that Herod the Great died in 4 BC is just wrong. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. Let us review what we know about the timing of the Savior's birth. The Jews expected the Messiah to be born on the night of the Passover feast. 
DNC 20, verse 1, says that the Savior was born on April 6th. President Harold B. Lee and President Spencer W. Kimball confirmed that. Jews counted a day from sunset to sunset. The Passover meal, known as the Seder, was after sunset on what we would consider the previous day. But to the Jews, it was part of the feast day. For example, in 1 BC, the Seder was after sunset on the day we would call April 5th. But to the Jews, since it was after sunset, the Seder was part of April 6th, which was called the feast day. Jewish rabbis in that day began their ministries on their 30th birthday. John 2, verses 23 through 24, says that the first day of the Savior's ministry was on the Passover feast day. Lambs were sacrificed on the afternoon before the after-sunset Passover meal. April 6, 1 BC, was a Passover feast day. The Passover feast day in 30 AD was the Savior's 30th birthday. The only time within reasonably possible years that the Passover feast day, 30 years apart, were on the same day of the year, were in 1 BC and 30 AD. If the Savior was born in 1 BC, that would mean that his crucifixion would have been in 33 AD. In 33 AD, the Passover feast was on Saturday, April 2nd, which means that lambs would have been slaughtered on Friday, April 1st. Independent evidence shows that calendars of native people now living in Mesoamerica did not have leap years. Using either the Julian calendar in use at the time of the Savior or the Gregorian calendar we use now, the number of days from April 6th, 1 BC, to April 1st, 33 AD, would be 33 years times 365 days plus 8 leap days minus five days since it was April 1st instead of April 6th. That makes 12,048 days. Since the people now in Mesoamerica didn't use leap days, but did use calendars with 365 days per year, for them, 12,048 days would have been 33 years and three days, putting the crucifixion on the fourth day of the first month of the 34th year just as the Book of Mormon states. The only way these numbers work out this way, with the first day of the Savior's ministry on the Passover feast day, and exactly the right number of days from the Savior's birth to his crucifixion, as stated in the Book of Mormon, is if the Savior was born on April 6th, 1 BC. In the Book of Mormon, we learned that the law of Moses pointed the children of Israel forward toward the Messiah. The Passover Seder meal is especially symbolic. Grape juice symbolizes the blood of the Savior as shed in Gethsemane and on Calvary. Unleavened bread is symbolic of the humble way in which the Savior allowed his body to die for us, the bread of life. Bitter herbs are symbolic of bondage and sin. The sweet fruit salad eaten after the bitter herbs is symbolic of freedom and forgiveness. The main course was a lamb without blemish. The Passover, and especially the Passover Seder meal, reminded the Jews that the Messiah would come. Especially in the days of bondage to Rome, the Jews were looking forward to the Messiah. They had a tradition that the Messiah would be born on the Passover feast day. If the Savior was born in 1 BC, Mary was in labor as all of Israel partook of the Passover Seder meal, celebrating their delivery from Pharaoh in the days of Moses and praying for the Messiah to come. If the Savior was born in 1 BC, the guest chamber would have been full of people eating the Passover. The word for room in Norwegian means place. A crowded guest chamber was certainly no place for a woman in labor and having a baby. But where would they go? Surely Joseph knew of the tradition that the Messiah would be announced from the Tower of the Flock. If the Tower of the Flock was part of the wall of the castle, perhaps the outer wall with the village nearby, 
It would have only been a short distance from the village to the tower. On that busy night, it would have been a quiet place, protected from weather and animals. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you was born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the day wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on peace, on earth peace, goodwill toward men. When the shepherds heard that the babe was wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, it would have been only natural for them to know right where to go to the to the tower of the flock on the outer wall of the ruined castle of Bethlehem. And it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which is come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. After the babe had been born and the shepherds had come to bear witness of what they had seen and heard, Mary and Joseph took the baby to the temple and performed all of the rituals required by the law of Moses. These rituals would have taken 40 days, after which Joseph, Mary, and the babe returned nearly due north from Bethlehem to Nazareth. Wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, seeking the king of the Jews. In the east, they had seen his star. A verse in Numbers, chapter 24, verse 17, says, There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. Although that is a messianic prophecy, it does not say there would be a new star at the Messiah's birth. And yet, for some reason, the people of Jerusalem were troubled and believed the wise men. Herod was so troubled that he called the wise men to come to him. It was then that he directed the wise men to go to Bethlehem to find the child for him. But the child wasn't there. Joseph and Mary and the baby had returned to, to Nazareth. Was it from Bethlehem that the star of Bethlehem led the wise men? So Herod sent the wise men to Bethlehem. And then the star helped him find where the young child was. Since he was a young child, he wasn't a baby anymore. What do we know about the star? The star went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. The Greek for went before means led forward. The Greek for came can be translated appeared. The Greek for stood does employ that the, imply that the stars stayed in the same place. So the star appeared and led the wise men forward and stayed in the same place. So it may not have had to move at all. Samuel the Lamanite prophesied that there would be great lights in heaven, more than a single new star, so that there would be a day and a night and a day with no darkness. He also prophesied that there would be a new star, one that they had not seen before. Nova in, is the feminine form of the Latin word novus, which means new. In astronomy, a nova is a kind of star. This is an artist's conception of a nova from Wikipedia, which says that a nova is a cataclysmic nuclear explosion caused by the accretion of hydrogen onto the surface of a white dwarf star. In other words, a nova can only happen 
when a large star has a small white dwarf orbiting it. Material from the large star flows to the white dwarf until there is a reaction and a sudden burst of light is released. A nova called RSO Fuji has flared up six times since 1898, the most recent time in February 2006. It is possible for such a binary star to be invisible to the naked eye, to flare up and be visible for a period of time, then disappear and reappear later. Polaris is a trinary star, a large star with a nearby white dwarf and a smaller one farther away. Polaris is increasing in intensity, and if the rate is constant, it is at least two and a half times as bright now as in about 11, uh, in about 110 AD, when Ptolemy of Alexandria was the first astronomer to document it. According to Wikipedia, during the first millennium BC, Beta Ursae Minoris, also known as Kochab, was the bright star closest to the celestial pole, but it was never close enough to be taken as marking the pole. And the Greek navigator Pythias in about 320 BC described the celestial pole as devoid of stars. When the wise men entered the Messiah's house, they saw him and Mary. And worshiping the child Jesus, whose name means savior, they presented him with their gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. It could be that some of that gold was needed to take their journey and flee from Herod. With Herod knowing that the wise men had gone to find the king. Since Joseph was the rightful king of Israel, he and his family were not safe anywhere in Israel, so they fled to Egypt. After the death of Herod, Joseph and Mary and the child returned to Nazareth. By age 12, the Savior knew that he was the Messiah and that Joseph was not his biological father. He taught, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But he was mostly rejected. He suffered for all that we might not suffer if we would repent. Elder Bruce R. McConkie said, we do not know, we cannot tell, no mortal mind can conceive the full import of what Christ did in Gethsemane. We know that in some way, incomprehensible to us, his suffering satisfied the demands of justice ransomed penitent souls from the pains and penalties of sin and made mercy available to those who believe in his holy name. Elder Monkey, McConkey continues, finally on a hill called Calvary, the cross was raised. Then the heavens grew black. Darkness covered the land for the space of three hours as it did among the Nephites. There was a mighty storm as though the very God of nature was in agony. And truly he was, for while he was hanging on the cross for these three hours, all the infinite agonies and merciless pains of Gethsemane recurred. He saw all those whom he redeemed and felt our sorrows. Through the atonement, we are spiritually begotten and become his sons and daughters. His atonement covered not just this earth, but all of his creations, worlds without number. President Gordon B. Hinckley stated, we honor his birth, but without his death, that birth would have been but one more birth. It was the redemption which he worked out in the Garden of Gethsemane and upon the cross of Calvary, which made his gift immortal, universal, and everlasting. His was a great atonement for the sins of all mankind. He was the resurrection and the life. Because of him, all men will be raised from the grave. But beyond this, he taught us the way, the truth, and the life. He gave the keys through which we may go on to immortality and eternal life. We love him. We honor him. We thank him.